The experience of World War II demonstrated that fast-moving ships were highly effective in delivering surprise attacks and supporting landing operations. However, the water resistance significantly limited the ship's maximum speed. But it is possible to break away from the water surface and move over it using a so-called ground effect. Ground effect is an alteration of wings lift properties at low altitude flight. Meanwhile, the increase of lift force can reach even 50%, and the lift to drag ratio can be increased by whole 100% and even more. Vessels that use the ground effect are called ground effect vehicles, or ekranoplanes in Russian. In the early 1960s, the Soviet Union approved a project to develop these vehicles. One of the outcomes of this project was the VVA-14 amphibious airplane, which was built in 1972 by the Beriev Design Bureau. It was designed by a team led by Robert Bartini. However, the VVA-14 wasn't technically an ekranoplan, as it only used the ground effect for non-contact takeoff and landing, rather than sustained flight close to the ground like traditional ekranoplanes. Ekranoplanes are typically designed to fly close to the surface, either over land or water, but more commonly over water due to the smoother surface, which helps maintain stable ground effect. In the case of the VVA-14, it was an amphibious aircraft, so it was intended to operate over both water and land. However, the ground effect in most ekranoplanes is typically used over water, since water provides a more consistent surface for generating the aerodynamic cushion that the ground effect requires. So to clarify, the VVA-14 used ground effect primarily over water for takeoff and landing. Implementation of this project would result in the development of an airplane that would not require airfields offering far superior capabilities compared to conventional vertical takeoff aircrafts. The leadership of the aviation industry was strongly opposed to ekranoplanes and seaplanes. Since these vehicles could float, officials thought the shipbuilding industry should handle them. However, the shipbuilders were not enthusiastic about dealing with craft that could leave the water's surface and take flight. As a result, the development of ekranoplanes was assigned to the Central Design Bureau for hydrofoils. Rostislav Alexeyev, a talented and energetic engineer, led the bureau. Work in this area was conducted under strict censorship, and the word ekranoplan became a classified term. All prototypes were referred to as fast boats. The Bureau began constructing several self-propelled, remotely controlled models to push the project forward. The trials took place at the Gorky Reservoir, far from prying eyes. These tests focused on refining key engineering solutions, such as the Akranoplan's ability to exit the water onto shore and move across land and ice surfaces. Building on the insights gained from these experiments, a massive Akranoplan, nearly 100 meters long, was constructed at the Volga plant in 1966. The Akranoplane originally got the name KM, which stands for Karabi Makit, meaning model ship. Later on, when the Americans discovered it from satellite imagery, they nicknamed it the Caspian Sea Monster. At the time, it was the largest and heaviest flying vehicle in the world. For several years, trials were conducted, and they confirmed the accuracy of the key engineering solutions. The state committee gave its evaluation praising the Akranoplan's seaworthiness and overall service performance. With a maximum takeoff weight of 544 tons, this giant could reach speeds of up to 500 kilometers per hour. This monster became the first in a series of large Akranoplans designed by Rostislav Alexeyev's bureau. The KM had a wingspan of 37.6 meters and a length of 92 meters. It could carry a maximum weight of 544 metric tons and was designed to fly at low altitudes of 5 to 10 meters to take advantage of the ground effect. The KM was powered by 10 RD7 turbojet engines, two on the tail and eight on the front. After takeoff, the eight front engines would shut off, leaving the two tail engines for normal flying. Because it flew so low, the KM was hard to detect on radar. Although it was technically an aircraft, Authorities viewed it more like a boat, so it was assigned to the Soviet Navy, but operated by test pilots from the Soviet Air Forces. Initially, the KM was seen as a promising vehicle for military and rescue operations. However, its design presented several challenges, which slowed progress, leading Alexeyev to focus on other Ekranoplan projects. The KM was tested on the Caspian Sea for 15 years, until 1980, 
when a pilot error caused a crash that destroyed the craft. Fortunately, there were no human casualties, but the KM was damaged and no attempts were made to recover it. It was left to float and eventually sank a week later. In the autumn of 1972, specialists from the Central Design Bureau launched a medium-sized ekranoplan for sea trials. This craft, named the A-90 Orleanoc, meaning eaglet, was designed as a landing transport vessel intended to carry wheeled and tracked vehicles as well as personnel to areas of military operations. Its high speed allowed for the rapid movement of troops, far surpassing the capabilities of traditional landing ships and enabling surprise attacks. The A-90 also had the unique advantage of flying over obstacles such as counter-landing defenses and minefields, which posed no threat to it. The A-90 proved invaluable for securing footholds on well-defended shores. Additionally, it had the capability to fly like an airplane at altitudes of up to 6 kilometers when necessary. The Orleanoc had a very unique engine layout, designed to meet the specific demands of this unconventional aircraft. Its main cruising power came from a Kuznetsov NK-12 turboprop engine, mounted at the top of the tail. Up front, the aircraft had two turbofan engines with air intakes located on top of the nose and exhaust running along the sides of the fuselage. These engines had vectored thrust, which was directed under the wings to provide additional lift and propulsion, known as power augmented ram thrust, during takeoff. Once in cruise flight and within ground effect, the front engines could be turned off since their power wasn't needed anymore. This also helped avoid the intake of water, salt, or low flying birds. For both takeoff and landing, large flaps running the full span of the wings helped increase lift and capture PR thrust to further boost air pressure. When landing on water, the A-90 was supported by a hydro ski that extended from the belly below the main wings. The A-90 could carry a crew of up to 150 personnel, making it highly capable for transporting large groups during its missions. Following the success of the first Orleanoc, three more were launched. In total, four Orleanocs were built, though the original plan called for the construction of 120. But the plans were not destined to be realized. The Ministry of Defense Ustinov died in 1984. He was actively supporting the idea for construction of fleet of landing Akranoplans. The new Ministry of Defense, Sokolov closed the program by his volitional decision, and the funds were sent to construction of nuclear submarines. Alexeyev's team developed the next giant Akranoplan, known as the LUN, as part of Project 903. It made its maiden flight over the Caspian Sea in 1985. The Lone was notable for its outstanding performance, with more efficient fuel consumption and a greater payload capacity than traditional airplanes. Additionally, it surpassed hovercrafts and hydrofoils in speed, combat capability, and the amount of cargo it could carry. The Lone had a low radar profile, making it difficult for ship radars to detect, and it was unmatched in terms of survivability. It was armed with the powerful supersonic Mosquit missile, featuring a ramjet cruise engine capable of sinking any combat ship with a bit of luck. These missiles were first deployed on the latest Soviet destroyers in the early 1980s, and the Lone was also equipped with them. Its primary mission was to work alongside other Navy forces to target and eliminate adversary carrier groups. The Lune was powered by eight Kuznetsov NK-87 turbojet engines, each producing around 28,660 pounds of thrust. These engines were mounted on the forward part of the fuselage to help achieve lift through the ground effect over water. The Lund class could reach a maximum speed of about 550 km per hour, making it much faster than traditional ships. Its operational range was approximately 2,000 km. Ekrano plans had a promising future ahead of them. However, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a lack of funding to maintain the Lund and other Ekrano plans. As a result, Further development in this field was ultimately cancelled. In April 1989, a tragic incident occurred with the nuclear submarine Komsomolets in the Norwegian Sea. Despite the submariner's valiant struggle for survival over six hours, rescue efforts arrived too late. This highlighted the Navy's inadequate means for effective crew rescue operations far from naval bases. Rescue ships were too slow and aviation lacked the capabilities to provide timely assistance to distressed submarines. A year later, the Akranoplan Lund participated in maritime rescue exercises in the Caspian Sea 
testing operations in both calm and stormy weather conditions. The conclusion was clear. If the Baltic fleet had a similar Akrana plan, it could have reached submarines in distress within two hours of an incident like the Komsomolets. These exercises underscored the Akrana plan's potential as effective life-saving assets. A civil project based on the LUN, called Lifesaver, was developed with the goal of improving maritime rescue. However, the project was ultimately halted due to a lack of funding, leaving its potential unrealized.